You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. During the late Roman Republic, a significant internal conflict arose between two leading Roman figures, Gaius Julius Caesar and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, often referred to as Pompey. The core dispute centered around Caesar's expected return to Rome as his term as governor of Gaul was about to end. Amid broader concerns about his political ambitions and status within the Republic, Caesar had been engaged in the conquest of Gaul for nearly a decade before tensions peaked in late 50 before Christ. The situation escalated when Pompey, siding with certain factions in the Senate, compelled the legislative body to issue a command for Caesar to lay down his command and disband his army at the start of 49 before Christ. Caesar defied this directive and opted to march his forces towards Rome, igniting the civil war. The conflict spread across multiple regions, including Italy, Illyria, Greece, Egypt, Africa, and Hispania. A turning point arrived in Greece during 48, before Christ with two major clashes. Caesar suffered a defeat at the Battle of Dyrrhachium, but later achieved a significant victory at the Battle of Pharsalus. This defeat led to the dissolution of Pompey's forces and the subsequent capitulation of many of his prominent supporters, including figures such as Marcus, Junius Brutus, and Cicero. Some, like Cato the Younger and Metellus Scipio, continued their resistance. Pompey himself sought refuge in Egypt, but was killed upon his arrival. In the aftermath, Caesar pursued military engagements in Asia Minor and North Africa, where he overcame Metellus Scipio in the Battle of Thapsus in 46 before Christ. The aftermath saw the suicides of both Cato and Scipio. Caesar finalized his victories by defeating Pompey's remaining forces, commanded by Labienus at the Battle of Munda in Spain the following year. Not long after these events, the Roman Senate declared Caesar as dictator perpetuo, which effectively made him the unrivaled ruler of the Republic. However, his position was short-lived, as he was assassinated by a collective of senators that included Brutus. The civil war and the subsequent outcome are considered by some historians to mark one of the definitive ends of the Roman Republic. They argue that the disruption caused by the war and the extreme divisions it entailed contributed to the eventual fall of the Republic. While Caesar's dominance was unquestioned by the end of the war, his abrupt death left a notable void in power. In the ensuing years, Caesar's heir, Octavian, would seize the opportunity to consolidate control and ultimately establish the Roman Empire, taking the name Augustus. The central issue that ultimately led to war was how to reintegrate Julius Caesar into Roman politics after his decade-long tenure in Gaul, where he gained significant power and wealth. Caesar began governing Cisalpine Gaul and Illyricum in 58 before Christ. After his 59 before Christ consulship, as dictated by the Lex Vatinia and later also controlled Transalpine Gaul by Senate assignment. During his consulship, he formed a political alliance with Crassus and Pompey, known as the First Triumvirate, which dramatically changed the political landscape, providing mutual short-term gains, but also creating long-term opposition from aristocratic factions. The alliance began deteriorating in the mid-50s before Christ, although it briefly stabilized with a renewed deal leading to the joint consulship of Pompey and Crassus in 55 before Christ. Pompey gained control of Spain, and Crassus went to Syria to engage the Parthians, while Caesar had his command in Gaul extended. The alliance started to fall apart more decidedly, with Crassus' death in 53 before Christ and Caesar's daughter Julia, who was married to Pompey in 54 before Christ. Without the balancing effect of Crassus and Julia, tension between Pompey and Caesar grew. Further contributing to the rising tensions, was the overarching rivalry against Pompey's influence since 61 before Christ, pushing him to find allies like Crassus and Caesar. However, political chaos from 55 to 52 before Christ 
characterized by violent clashes orchestrated by figures like Publius Clodius Pulcher and Titus Annius Milo, escalated to a point where the Senate felt compelled to name Pompey as the sole consul in 52 before Christ, giving him unprecedented control without a proper election. By 51 before Christ, there were significant attempts to strip Caesar of his military power, with Marcus Claudius Marcellus asserting that Caesar's victory at Elysia meant his mission in Gaul was complete and suggesting his command should end. Nonetheless, such motions were defeated in the Senate, partly due to Pompey's influence. The situation worsened in the summer of 50 before Christ, with Pompey now demanding that Caesar relinquish his army before seeking re-election as consul. While the Senate generally sought a peaceful resolution and supported the notion of both Pompey and Caesar disbanding their armies, the proposal was ultimately shot down by Pompey and the consul at the time, leading to allegations that Caesar was planning an invasion of Italy, a claim leveraged to authorize Pompey to defend the Republic. Speculations that Caesar went to war to avoid prosecution for alleged legal transgressions during his 59 before Christ consulship, based on writings from Suetonius and Asinius Pollio, are regarded as dubious. No concrete evidence suggests that a trial against Caesar was a looming threat. Instead, it's believed that Caesar's ambition for a second consulship and triumph, impeded by political obstacles, along with the strategic timing of military readiness, influenced his choice for war. Caesar himself rationalized the war as an act of protecting the tribune's rights, but this justification lacked credibility. Historians attribute personal pride as a significant motive, with both Caesar and Pompey being unwilling to back down. Caesar resisted conservative pressures and Pompey's dominance, while Pompey refused Caesar's assertive proposals. Although there seemed to be little outright desire for war until the final weeks, the bony Rome's conservative elite found themselves cornered politically, making it difficult to back down with dignity, and Caesar could not afford to see his status and reputation compromised through concession. In the time leading up to January of 49 before Common Era, Julius Caesar and a faction opposed to him, including figures like Pompey and Cato, were each under the impression that the other side would eventually retreat or at least offer acceptable conditions for peace. Over the preceding years, the trust that had once existed between Caesar and his adversaries had diminished, and constant standoffs had damaged any prospect of reaching a mutual agreement. On the first day of 49 before Common Era, Caesar expressed a willingness to step down from his command if his fellow generals would do the same. He conveyed a message that he would not tolerate any imbalances in military power between himself and Pompey, implying that he would consider war if his demands were not met. This sentiment is captured by Gruen, who quotes Caesar, saying he would not endure any disparity in their Caesar's and Pompey's forces. While Caesar's envoys in Rome delivered a more moderate proposition, offering to relinquish his control over Transalpine Gaul under the condition that he could retain two legions and run for the consulship without relinquishing his imperium, which would guarantee his eligibility for a triumph. These terms were outright rejected. Cato was particularly obstinate, insisting that he would only consider proposals that were brought forth in a public session of the Senate. As tensions escalated and both sides readied their troops for war, the Senate was swayed on January 7th, 49 before Common Era. To issue an ultimatum to Caesar, he must abandon his military command or face being declared an enemy of the state. Subsequently, the Senate proceeded to revoke Caesar's privilege of running for office in his absence and named a successor to his governorship in Gaul. Despite pro-Caesar tribunes attempting to block these moves through their vetoes, the Senate disregarded their opposition and issued the Senatus Consultum Ultimum which authorized state officials to take whatever measures were necessary to protect the state's interests. In a dramatic turn of events, tribunes supporting Caesar fled the city and sought refuge in Caesar's military encampment, signaling their allegiance 
and the intensification of the crisis. In the early days of January, either on the 10th or 11th, Julius Caesar led his troops across the Rubicon River, effectively crossing the geographical line that separated the province of Cisalpine Gaul from the heartland of Italy to the south. The act of crossing the Rubicon was imbued with historical weight, as it is said that Caesar uttered the famous phrase, Alia Iacta Est, the die is cast, as reported by the historian Suetonius. Plutarch presents an alternative version, suggesting that Caesar actually spoke in Greek, quoting the playwright Menander, Anarifto Kivos, let the die be thrown. However, Caesar's own writings do not acknowledge this watershed moment at the Rubicon. This event initiated open conflict and positioned Caesar as a challenger to the established order, earning him the label of a rebel. Loyalties among the troops were generally with their commanders, Caesar's forces, loyal due to his role as their leader and benefactor, contrasted with those who followed Pompey and the consular leadership, who were seen as the embodiment of the Roman state. In addressing his own soldiers, Caesar recounted grievances against him by his political adversaries, painted Pompey as a betrayer, and emphasized the Senate's disregard for the veto power of the tribunes. He illustrated this point by showcasing tribunes who had disguised themselves to avoid capture. Caesar specifically criticized the Senate's extreme decree, the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, arguing it was excessive except in cases where Rome faced immediate danger. For many Romans, choosing sides in the conflict proved a complex decision, with most people being ambivalent at the beginning of the war. Gaius Claudius Marcellus is an example of this hesitation, opting for neutrality, despite his earlier role in charging Pompey with Rome's defense in 50 BC. Marcus Junius Brutus faced a particular personal quandary, torn between his past, which included being orphaned by Pompey and a connection to both Caesar and Cato the Younger, and eventually decided to join Pompey's forces. Even Caesar's trusted Gaulish lieutenant, Titus Labienus, switched allegiance to Pompey, perhaps motivated by past loyalties or resentment of Caesar's monopoly on military glory. For when Julius Caesar made his move toward Italy, the region was not prepared for an invasion. With foresight on his side, Caesar took control of Ariminum, known today as Rimini, effortlessly because his soldiers had quietly moved into the city ahead of time. He quickly seized three additional cities as well. By around January 17th, Rome got wind of Caesar's aggressive move into Italy. Pompey reacted by acknowledging the onset of a civil war through an edict, indicating he would consider anyone who didn't join him as aligning with Caesar. And thus, he and his followers, including some neutral senators, exited the city to avoid the brutal conflicts reminiscent of past civil wars. Many senators opted to distance themselves by retreating to their rural properties. Toward January's end, Caesar reached out to Pompey with a proposal that suggested both of them retreat to their respective provinces, which would mean Pompey going to Spain and then dissolve their forces. Pompey was open to the terms on the condition that both parties immediately leave Italy and allow the Senate to mediate the dispute. Caesar declined as it meant giving away the strategic upper hand he had gained through his unexpected invasion. Thus, he pressed on with his advance. Caesar's forces continued on without much resistance, including at Aguvium, where enemy cohorts commanded by Quintus Minucius Thermus deserted. Caesar's army then took Picenum, an area connected to Pompey's lineage, with ease. While there was a single skirmish, there was no widespread resistance, as Caesar's men avoided pillaging, and his adversaries lacked support from the locals. Reinforcements arrived for Caesar in February 49 BC, and he took Asculum when the defending soldiers abandoned their post. Serious resistance eventually emerged when Caesar approached Corfinium, where Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, recently appointed as the governor of Gaul by the Senate, was holding out. Ahenobarbus was encouraged by Pompey to retreat and unite with him, yet Ahenobarbus kept requesting reinforcements. Amid preparations for a siege, 
Ahenobarbus was abandoned by Pompey. This prompted his own men to arrest him after he attempted to secretly flee. Caesar laid siege to Corfinium for a week until its surrender, which resulted in the capture of about 50 senators and equestrians. Caesar graciously let these individuals go free, and even returned six million sestertii from Ahenobarbus to his troops after requiring their oath of loyalty. Caesar proceeded down the Adriatic coast with a surprising level of restraint and discipline. His forces refrained from looting, as had been common before during previous conflicts. Unlike Sulla and Marius, Caesar did not exact revenge on his political foes. His clemency likely kept the Italian population neutral, if not favorable toward him. Meanwhile, Pompey planned a strategic relocation to Greece to muster a formidable army from the eastern provinces and made his way to Brundisium, present-day Brindisi. He commandeered merchant ships for traversal of the Adriatic Sea. Caesar caught up with Pompey in Brundisium on March 9th, with six legions in tow. By then, a majority of Pompey's troops had left the city, except for two legions that awaited transportation. Caesar attempted to block the harbor and restart talks, but his barriers didn't hold, and Pompey refused to engage in dialogue. Pompey managed an escape to the east with nearly all his forces, leaving Caesar behind with the ships in the region. After facing a challenge and capitalizing on Pompey's departure to the east, Julius Caesar directed his attention westward toward Hispania, known as Spain. Back in Italy, he gathered a poorly attended session of the truncated Senate on the 1st of April, where he reiterated his grievances and asked for envoys to be sent to dialogue with Pompey. Although the Senate approved his proposal, no one stepped forward to serve as an envoy. Additionally, Caesar convened a meeting with the Common People's Council, promising each citizen 300 sestertii and maintaining the grain supply. Yet the response was lukewarm. When Tribune Lucius Cassilius Metellus tried to block Caesar's access to the state treasury, he was either disregarded or intimidated until he relented, exposing the disingenuous nature of Caesar's initial claim of defending the rights of the tribunes. In this instance, as one historian pointed out, the man who had proclaimed that he was championing the rights of the tribunes in January was now as ready as his opponents to threaten one of these magistrates. In his treasury raid, Caesar nabbed approximately 15,000 gold ingots, 30,000 silver ingots, and 30 million sesterdi, even taking a fund allocated for protection against Gallic invasions. While leaving Mark Antony in charge of Italy, Caesar headed for Spain. He laid siege to Massilia, modern-day Marseille, along the way, since they had denied him access and were under the leadership of Domitius Ahenobarbus. Caesar left a force to continue the siege and proceeded to Spain, accompanied by a minimal guard and German cavalry. In June 49 BC, he arrived and overcame a Pompeian army led by Lucius Afranius and Marcus Petraeus at the Battle of Ilerda. Soon thereafter, Pompey's remaining representative in Spain, Marcus Terentius Vero, capitulated, placing all of Spain under Caesar's dominion. While Caesar was dealing with Spain, he dispatched his adjutant, Curio, to take over Sicily and Africa, with help from Gaius Caninius Rebellus. However, in August 49 BC, Curio was killed, and his troops were roundly defeated at the Battle of the Bagratus River. Later, in December 49 BC, Caesar returned to Rome, leaving Quintus Cassius Longinus in charge of Spain. Back in Rome as dictator, Caesar presided over elections for consul of the upcoming year and took advantage of his dictatorial privileges to annul the rulings of Pompey's courts from 52 BC. This action pardoned those previously exiled, barring Titus Annius Milo. It also reinstated the political privileges of those whose parents had been targeted during Sulla's prescriptions. Holding the dictatorship was crucial for Caesar in order to keep his military command, his province, and his right to a triumphal procession, all without relinquishing power while in Rome proper. After conducting elections in which he was voted in for another term, alongside Publius Servilius Vatia Isauricus as his colleague, 
Caesar resigned the dictatorship after just 11 days. He promptly returned to his campaign, setting off to chase Pompey across the Adriatic Sea. Caesar encountered logistical issues when he arrived at Brundisium, as he didn't have sufficient transports to move his entire army across the Adriatic Sea in one go. This necessitated multiple trips, a plan complicated by Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, commanding a Pompeian fleet on the eastern shore of the sea. On January 4th, 48 before Christ, which, due to calendar inaccuracies of the time, was actually late in the year, Caesar sailed unexpectedly and caught Pompey's scattered forces off guard during their winter break. Additionally, Bibulus's fleet was unprepared to engage. However, Bibulus quickly mobilized his fleet and managed to capture several of Caesar's ships on their return to Brundisium, leaving Caesar in a difficult spot with seven legions and not enough food. Nonetheless, Caesar made it to Apollonia without much resistance. Securing both a base and supplies, he moved towards Dyrrhachium, a main supply point for Pompey's forces, but had to pull back when Pompey got there first, with superior numbers. Once Mark Antony brought the rest of Caesar's army from Italy on April 10th, Caesar made a second attempt on Dyrrhachium, which resulted in the Battle of Dyrrhachium. Caesar aimed to cut off the defenders by surrounding them, but his attempts to take over the essential city failed when Pompey fortified his position. Caesar then besieged Pompey's camp. Following various skirmishes, Pompey managed to pierce through Caesar's fortifications, prompting Caesar to tactically retreat to Thessaly. In the aftermath, with intentions to protect Italy from an incursion, prevent Caesar from defeating the arriving forces from Syria under Scipio Nausicaa, and pressured by allies, who accused him of needlessly elongating the war, Pompey decided to pursue a decisive battle against Caesar. After uniting with Scipio's forces, Pompey followed Caesar, searching for advantageous terrain. After several days of small cavalry clashes, Caesar succeeded in drawing Pompey from a hill, culminating in the Battle of Pharsalus on a plain. There, Caesar's reserves held against a flanking strategy led by Labienus, leading to the defeat of Pompey's infantry by Caesar's seasoned soldiers. Following his victory, Caesar was appointed dictator for the second time in the October of that year, his term set for a full year. In desperation post-defeat, Pompey fled to Mytilene with his counselors, then to Cilicia, where he held a war council considering the next steps. Meanwhile, Cato's followers regrouped in Corsaira before heading to Libya. Others, like Marcus Junius Brutus, sought clemency from Caesar, wading through swamps to Larissa, where Caesar received him warmly. Pompey's council resolved to escape to Egypt, which had previously supported him with military aid the year before. Upon his arrival in Egypt, a fatal welcoming awaited Pompey in the form of a party including local Egyptians and two Roman officers with whom he had previously served. Tragically, his life was taken aboard their boat within sight of his wife and companions, recognizing Pompey as his formidable opponent. Due to Pompey's adeptness and established patronage system, Caesar had avidly tracked him across Asia and Cyprus, finally reaching Egypt only three days after Pompey's demise. There, Caesar faced the grim sight of Pompey's decapitated head and the presentation of his seal, which, as reported, greatly distressed him. With him reacting emotionally upon seeing the signet ring, his disgust and sorrow may well have been genuine, for from the beginning he had taken great pride in his clemency. The domestic strife in Egypt, further complicated by Rome's interference, often fueled by hefty Egyptian bribes, had led to a diminishment of Egypt's autonomy. Within this turbulent context, Caesar found himself embroiled in the conflict for the throne between siblings Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra, who were designated co-rulers in their father Ptolemy, the twelfth Alit's will, by 48 before Christ. Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra's relationship had deteriorated, amassing armies on either side of the Nile. Caesar, with the intention of settling his massive financial commitments, asserted a claim for the repayment of a 10 million denarii debt, 
promised by the previous king. In addition to this economic motive, he also took on the role of adjudicator for the succession argument between the royal siblings. Pothinus, the eunuch guardian of Ptolemy XIII, responded by rallying an army and initiating a siege during Caesar's stay in the royal quarter. Caesar, in turn, called for backup from nearby Roman territories. Amidst the siege in Alexandria, Caesar's acquaintance with Cleopatra evolved romantically after her clandestine visit. Subsequently, Caesar issued a verdict on the dynastic dispute, aligning with the will and decreeing co-rule for the siblings. Nonetheless, suspicions linger that Ptolemy XIII could have been aware of Caesar's affair with Cleopatra. The eventual arrival of relief forces, led by Mithridates of Pergamum, culminated in a decisive defeat for the Egyptian forces. Ptolemy XIII met his end, drowning as his escape vessel overturned. Following the conflict, Caesar established Cleopatra, along with her younger brother Ptolemy XIV, as rulers, and assigned the province of Cyprus to Egypt, presumably securing the financial settlement of his demand in the process. Despite suggestions to the contrary, in Caesar's Alexandrian war accounts, he remained in Egypt for a substantial period, reportedly cruising the Nile with Cleopatra, likely a gesture to both recuperate and demonstrate Rome's endorsement of her regime. Caesar's departure from Egypt around mid-47 before Christ was prompted by unraveling events in Asia. At this juncture, it has been suggested that Cleopatra was already expecting a child. He left behind military reinforcements to support Cleopatra's governance. Eventually, Cleopatra gave birth to a son, Ptolemy Caesar, also known as Caesarian by the people of Alexandria, and hailed by Caesar, who permitted the use of his name, suggesting his belief in his paternity. Pharnaces II, cognizant of the ongoing Roman civil war, aimed to reclaim territories his father had lost during previous conflicts. He quickly took control of extensive regions, including Cappadocia, Armenia, Eastern Pontus, and part of Lesser Colchis. Reports from Roman historians characterize Pharnaces as merciless, particularly for his orders to castrate captive Romans. His aggression faced little opposition since Pompey had redeployed military forces from the area until Caesar's deputy, Gnaeus Domitius Calvinus, engaged him near Nicopolis in December 48, before Christ with an unseasoned army, but did not prevail. In the meantime, Julius Caesar traveled north from Egypt along the coast of the eastern Mediterranean, aiming to confront Pharnaces' incursions and protect his own reputation, which stood to be tarnished if he allowed the intrusion to go unchallenged. Pharnaces tried to negotiate with Caesar, who spurned his attempts, citing his harsh treatment of Roman captives. Caesar sternly ordered Pharnaces to immediately evacuate the conquered lands, return the loot, and free all prisoners. The Roman forces met Pharnaces' troops near Zella. During the Roman camp's fortification, Pharnaces' forces launched a surprise assault, briefly causing disarray. However, Caesar's men promptly regrouped and repelled the attack, pushing Pharnaces' army down the hill. Following a pivotal moment on the Roman right flank, Pharnaces' forces were utterly defeated. Pharnaces escaped to his realm, only to be swiftly assassinated thereafter. The campaign was concluded remarkably quickly, spanning merely several weeks. Caesar's triumph was so promptly achieved that he famously boasted to a friend in Rome with the phrase, I came, I saw, I conquered, indicating his rapid victory. This phrase was notably displayed during his triumphal procession in Rome. Furthermore, he derisively remarked on Pompey's legacy, noting that Pompey had built his reputation by defeating such insignificant adversaries. In Rome, political activities persisted during the campaigns in Egypt and Pontus. In 47 BC, Publius Cornelius Dolabella was a tribune who pushed for the cancellation of debts and suspension of rents. Antony, acting as Caesar's deputy during his dictatorship, opposed these measures. When Antony had to leave for Campania to handle a revolt in the 9th and 10th legions of Caesar's army, Rome experienced an outbreak of civil disorder. 
The Senate issued the ultimate senatorial decree in response, but with no magistrates possessing appropriate authority to enforce it, the decree was initially ineffective. Upon Antony's return, he quelled the unrest, but suffered a hit to his reputation due to the violence and fatalities that occurred. Elsewhere, Cato marshaled his troops through the desert from Cyrenaica to Africa, which is current-day Tunisia, joining forces with Metellus Scipio. Together with Labienus, they succeeded in convincing one of Caesar's governors in Hispania Ulterior to switch allegiances. Caesar arrived back in Italy and Rome toward the end of 47 BC, where he reconciled with Cicero, who had lost faith in the Pompeian cause following Pompey's death, in Brundisium. Caesar made it apparent that he had lost trust in Antony, but, interestingly, not Dolabella. Adjusting the political environment to his advantage, Caesar appointed new magistrates for both 47 BC and the following year, infusing the priestly colleges and elective offices with his supporters, increasing the number of praetors from 8 to 10 as a reward for their fidelity. Opting out of the dictatorship, he chose to serve as consul with Lepidus as his colleague. The mutinous legions in Campania were not pacified by Caesar's return. Caesar dispatched Gaius Salustius Crispus, his lieutenant and soon-to-be praetor for 46 BC, to negotiate. But Sallust narrowly escaped an assassination attempt by the angry soldiers. In the end, Caesar personally addressed the troops, offering them discharges, promises of land, and retirement benefits. The soldiers, stunned by their unceremonious release, pleaded with Caesar to reconsider. Pretending to be convinced, he agreed to re-enlist them, although he took a mental note to place those involved in the revolt in vulnerable positions in the anticipated campaign. Back in Italy, Caesar seized and sold the estates of Pompey and other opponents, who had either been killed or not pardoned, and also sought additional funds. Dolabella's debt relief initiatives were left unattended by Caesar, who reasoned that he would be the principal beneficiary due to his own substantial debts. Selling confiscated properties at market value was a letdown for some of Caesar's followers, but also displayed the severity of Caesar's financial problems. In the latter days of December, Julius Caesar called his soldiers to convene at Lilybaeum on the island of Sicily. He welcomed a lesser-known member of the Scipio family, Scipio Salvito, or Salutio, onto his staff due to the legendary belief that a Scipio could not meet defeat in Africa. Caesar marshaled six legions in Sicily and embarked for Africa on the 25th of December in the year 47 before Christ. Their voyage was plagued by a tempest and fierce winds. Consequently, only about 3,500 infantry and a detachment of 150 cavalry managed to land with Caesar near Hadrumentum, an adversary's port. According to popular lore, upon disembarking and stumbling on the beach, Caesar quipped to avert the ill omens by clenching the sand and proclaiming, I have hold of you, Africa. Once the African campaign began, Caesar's troops were substantially outnumbered by the armies under the command of Metellus Scipio, which was comprised of ten legions, albeit likely not at full strength, and a significant contingent of allied cavalry commanded by King Juba I of Numidia along with an impressive fleet of about 120 war elephants. Leveraging the element of surprise, Caesar took the opportunity to regroup his dispersed forces and directed requests back to Sicily for additional soldiers. Given the Pompeians' control over most food supplies, quick action was vital. Caesar chose to bypass Hadramentum after it declined to capitulate and instead established a base at Ruspina. While leading a considerable foraging group, Caesar's troops became engaged in a skirmish with forces under Labienus. His less experienced soldiers struggled under the pressure from Numidian cavalry until they had to fall back following a counterassault, securing a strategic defeat for Caesar as it hindered his ability to gather necessary provisions. Pressured by shortages, Caesar fortified his position at Ruspina. Meanwhile, Metellus Scipio, joined forces with Labienus only three miles from Caesar's camp. Their ally, King Juba, 
was also en route to join them, but was compelled to redirect his attention westward when Bacchus II of Mauritania, Caesar's unintended ally, invaded his realm. Bacchus's forces were headed by the Roman mercenary Publius Sidius, an escapee from Rome post-collapse of the Second Catilinarian Conspiracy. Meanwhile, Scipio's forces were dealing with rampant defections. Caesar maintained a defensive posture until he was reinforced by two more legions, 800 Gallic horsemen and a substantial food supply. These reinforcements allowed him to resume an offensive stance. There were several skirmishes between Caesar and Metellus Scipio over terrain near Uzida and an essential water source. The deadlock persisted until Caesar's rank swelled with the addition of veteran legions who had staged a mutiny in Campania. Constrained by dwindling supplies and little prospect of seizing Uzida, Caesar decided to march elsewhere, capturing some food supplies on the way to besiege Thapsus. In Thapsus, Caesar effectively compelled the Pompeians to form battle lines. With advantageous terrain that restricted the enemy's numerical superiority, Caesar's troops unexpectedly launched their assault, rapidly disbanding the opposing forces. Plutarch notes an alternative account, suggesting Caesar, sensing an epileptic episode approaching, withdrew to rest, leading to the chaotic yet effective attack. Despite the cause, Metellus Scipio's troops faced a staggering defeat, suffering around 10,000 fatalities to Caesar's minimal 50. Although Metellus Scipio and other Pompeian leaders managed to flee, many met their ends through suicide or execution shortly after. Scipio himself chose death over capture at sea. Juba and Marcus Petraeus took their lives in a mutually agreed duel. Halofbinus escaped to Spain to join forces with Gnaeus and Daxus Pompey. Meanwhile, Cato the Younger, overseeing Utica, was absent from the Thapsus conflict. Learning of the defeat, he deliberated with his mere 300 soldiers. Afterward, Cato engaged in a final act of defiance by stabbing himself, rejecting medical aid by ensuring his own death. His actions reflected a desire to evade conceding to Caesar's mercy. Afterward, Caesar lingered in Africa to levy punitive fines on communities loyal to Pompey. During his stay, he also had a brief liaison with Unui, King Bogud of Mauritania's wife. By June 46 before Christ, Caesar headed back to Rome, with a brief stop in Sardinia, arriving in the capital towards the end of July. Upon his return to Rome, Caesar marked his conquests with a series of triumphal celebrations honoring his victories in Gaul, Egypt, Asia, and Numidia. Though the African triumph was delicately attributed to the defeat of King Juba of Numidia rather than to Romans, the festivities took place from September 21st to October 2nd, featuring grand processions with prisoners and spoils on display. Caesar notably took the unusual step of being escorted by 72 lictors, a number significantly higher than the usual allotment for a consul or dictator, reflecting his thrice-held dictatorship. Alongside the triumphant displays, Caesar held large-scale games and feasts and was generous towards his soldiers, distributing a large sum of money equivalent to over 16 years of pay, with higher-ranking officers receiving even more. The record of Caesar's campaign in Spain is chronicled in The Spanish War, considered to be authored by one of Caesar's officers. The account is not highly regarded due to the narrator's heavy-handed style, as noted by Elizabeth Rawson in The Cambridge Ancient History, who comments on the clumsy narrator and the work's poor Latin amidst widespread literary criticism. Despite these shortcomings, the text describes how Caesar ventured to Spain in November 46 BC to quell resistance, notably from those loyal to Pompey's family. Caesar's earlier appointee, Quintus Cassius Longinus, had instigated a revolt due to his disagreeable behavior and avarice, compelling provincials and troops to defect to the Pompeian side, with figures like Lebienus bolstering their ranks. As tensions mounted in Spain, Caesar, with a skeletal force of veterans, trusted Italy to Lepidus's care and marshaled eight legions to confront Gnaeus Pompey's considerable army. 
which posed a significant threat with over 13 legions and additional auxiliaries. The campaign was marred by brutal tactics, as Caesar's troops exhibited enemy heads on their barricades and committed mass killings of adversaries. Initially, Caesar broke a siege at Iulia before turning his attention to Cordoba, defended by Sextus Pompey, who appealed unsuccessfully to his brother Gnaeus for aid. Caesar's protracted siege of Cordoba bore little fruit, leading him to besiege Ategua. Defections weakened Gnaeus Pompey's forces, resulting in Ategua's capitulation on February 19, 45 BC. This surrender followed a brutal episode where the Pompeian commander executed suspected turncoats. With Gnaeus Pompey withdrawing from Ategua, Caesar's pursuit culminated in a showdown near Munda, where Caesar, driven by the necessity of a definitive victory, led his men in a grueling ascent to battle the Pompeians. The combat's intensity was such that Caesar notably took a personal role in rallying his troops, even as Plutarch recounts Caesar's admission that he fought not just for triumph, but for survival. During this clash, Caesar's losses were considerable. Eventually, Caesar's 10th legion broke the enemy's lines, leading to Labienus's death and Gnaeus Pompey's eventual capture and execution. Although Sextus Pompey evaded capture and other isolated insurgencies persisted, like the one led by Quintus Cassilius Bassus in Syria, the civil war effectively came to its conclusion. Following his triumphs, the Roman Senate commemorated Caesar's accomplishments with a declaration of 50 days of thanksgiving and conferred upon him the title Liberator. They also pledged to build a temple dedicated to the concept of liberty. Caesar was showered with various other honors subsequently. The Senate, eager to please, allowed him the privilege of using a distinctive seat amongst the consuls and erected an ivory effigy of him at the capital next to those of past rulers as well as in the temple of Quirinus. His birth month, Quinctilis, was renamed after him, which would eventually become known as July. A temple was established to honor his clemency. He was given the enduring title of Imperator, and he was named Parens Patriae, meaning father of his country. Caesar's journey back to Rome included a path through southern Gaul and Narbo Martius. During this passage, he established colonies for his veterans rewarded his loyal soldiers and supporters, and bestowed Latin rites to several Gallic communities. His reconciliation with Mark Antony also took place in this time frame. While in Cisalpine Gaul, he assured Marcus Junius Brutus a position as praetor for the year 44 BC and hinted at a future consulship in 41 BC. About one year after his departure, in October 45 BC, Caesar entered Rome to celebrate a contentious triumph over his fellow countrymen. Not all of Caesar's actions were met with approval. He allowed his legates, Quintus Pedius and Quintus Fabius Maximus, to have their own triumphs, none of which found favor with his Senate critics. Moreover, Caesar's political maneuvers, which undermined the value of the consulship and other offices, drew criticism especially when he arranged for Gaius Caninius Rebellus to serve an absurdly brief term as consul, mere hours before the end of the year, a spectacle that even prompted Cicero to lament its absurdity in a letter, remarking, If you could see it, you would weep. Despite these domestic controversies, Caesar set his sights on future campaigns upon returning to Rome. He began planning significant military expeditions into the regions of Dacia and Parthia. During the civil conflict, Caesar was initially appointed dictator on a temporary basis, but this role was made permanent in early 44 BC. As he exercised a form of rule that resembled a quasi-royal and semi-divine monarchy without a fixed end date, his power stirred unrest among certain factions. This discontent led to a successful plot to assassinate him on the 15th of March, 44 BC, mere days before he planned to embark on a campaign to Parthia. His murderers included former allies and military officers who had fought under him during the wars. 
as well as individuals whom he had previously forgiven. When examining the broader implications of these events, scholars offer differing interpretations. Eric Gruen suggests that Caesar's civil war served as a catalyst for the downfall of the Roman Republic, viewing the conflict as an accidental trigger for a series of disruptions in the Republic's political culture that led to its demise. Alternative perspectives come from scholars like Peter Brunt, who sees the Civil War as more of a symptom of the Republic's collapse, identifying the alienation of key interest groups as the root issue. Christian Meyer offers yet another angle, describing the period as a crisis without alternative, wherein the Republican institutions failed to adapt and reform from within. In this view, the institutions held too much reverence for any serious consideration of alternative political structures.